When Destiny was officially announced in February 2013, it had a lot to live up to. Bungie, the developer, had created the main series Halo games up until Halo Reach, which were some of the most critically acclaimed and groundbreaking titles to ever come out, and shaped the standard FPS campaign we know today. The original Halo had a fantastic campaign with rich lore and great level design. It was an absolute blast to play, especially with friends, and had an awesome protagonist, the hardcore Master Chief we all know and love. And while it wasn't some unbeatable FPS that completely changed everything we know about gaming, it surely set the new standard for FPS games, especially on the console. The regenerative shield, the low aim assist smooth gunplay, the slower squad based combat, and the customizability of difficulty options and modifiers. The huge levels with vast deep corridors, and plenty of vehicles to play around with, and the amazing comfortable controls. While most players went into it thinking they'd get a pretty fun FPS game to enjoy for a while, they got something so different, so imaginative and fun, they were simply blown away. When Halo 2 was released in 2004, it once again changed the landscape of gaming by delivering one of the best multiplayer packages for a console shooter, and setting a new standard completely designed for the new Xbox Live service. It also featured a campaign, and while flawed in terms of narrative and difficulty options, it was still a blast with awesome moments that made it feel just like a film. The Halo games were widely successful because the campaigns were fun, innovative, and ultimately game-changing, and the multiplayer was a blast for long hours into the night and could be played for infinite amounts of time with no diminishing returns. Bungie was now one of the most well-respected companies in gaming, easily. And when a first-person shooter MMORPG with a supposed massive game world and rich universe was announced, people were hype. And I'm not talking a little bit of hype because of a cool-looking trailer. I'm talking hype. Over the next year and a half, trailers were being constantly pumped out and new information was revealed, building the hype up. It tried to be so many things that are brought in an even wider audience, including Halo fans, open world game fans, and MMORPG fans. The insane claims Bungie made, such as, Destiny is intended to have players explore a big world that evolves and always gives a reason to come back, just made more players even more excited about the game. It was also revealed that the game would be a 10 year journey, implying the game would receive tons of content for 10 years and evolve with those updates into something larger, greater, and grander. Bungie stated at their GDC 2013 panel, Let's build a world where we can tell any story we want, a place millions of people will want to visit again and again for the next 10 years and more. I don't know if everybody watching can agree with this, but there may be that one franchise you always feel safe to pre-order games from. For me, it's Pokemon because I love the core gameplay and put deep trust into Nintendo to create a fun game for me that I can enjoy for many hours to come, considering I've enjoyed every main series Pokemon game to date. Audiences everywhere felt that this game would surely be a safe pre-order. Perhaps it's because they enjoyed the Halo series, maybe it's because they love MMORPGs, maybe it's because the world looks super interesting and they think the campaign will surely be of epic proportions. When the game was finally released in September 2014 after four years of waiting for a new title from Bungie, the game was met with massive disappointment. You done fucked it up! The story was very shallow, confusing, and didn't want to let the player know about this interesting expansive world Bungie has been crafting for the past two years. The RPG elements were minimal and the game had very little customization and a lot of grinding which most people did not enjoy. The Vault of Glass six-person raid, while proving to be the finest content to come out of the mess that was Destiny, was riddled with bugs and glitches that made the raid a complete joke to complete early on. While surely a financial success due to all the pre-orders and season pass purchases, the critics didn't receive it too well and the community was very disappointed in them. Although this game did really have a great soundtrack which you'll be hearing throughout the video. Fast forward a year later and the Taken King expansion is released. 
The Tekken King expansion was really good, because it improved greatly on the current system of the game, and added a pretty enjoyable story with a likable character and a defined villain, as well as a mechanically incredibly well-made raid. The new Dreadnought location was massive compared to the other areas the game had previously, and the game had so much more to do, giving much more replay value and reason to keep playing. When the Rise of Iron expansion came out in late 2016, it essentially added more to the Destiny formula we knew up until its death, like a fun new raid with a huge exotic weapon quest that took a collaborative and exciting effort from the internet to solve. It also introduced new awesome activities like the Archon's Forge, tons of new exotics and some returning ones, and hundreds of new items. Especially with the amazing Age of Triumph update, where all players, old and new, would participate in the older content Destiny already had that you never had an incentive to play since previous years such as the older raids, and lots of quality of life changes players had wanted for a long time. The final product of Destiny was a very solid replayable game, well grindy, and offered plenty for the player to do before getting bored. You never really ran out of things to do, there was always the next quest you never got around to completing, or a new PvP event. When Destiny 2 was announced, I was very excited because I really quite liked Destiny 1, or at least the final product of it, which is when I played it that the most. After all these great expansions that really improved the game, I thought that the game would take everything they have learned and create the game we always had wanted. The hyped up campaign that was apparently so much more expansive and interesting than the first game's campaigns was what I was really excited about because I thought they had finally learned. And now that I've played the game for about 90 hours and counting, I think I am qualified to give my thoughts on the game I was so excited for. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you my review of Destiny 2. I'm not going to perform a detailed analysis on the story today, though if you would like my thoughts on it briefly, I can give them to you. The game only has a few missions that truly stand out in my opinion. The first one, Homecoming, 1AU I think, and Chosen. The level design is decent at best, with a few levels using vehicles well, although the enemy's AI didn't really make any areas difficult at all as they jump in your face asking to be killed. I mean seriously, this game's campaign is jokingly easy. I can't even believe I died a few times. It is quite easily soloable and isn't scaled to fire teams, so with a team of more than one, the enemies aren't even harder to kill and do the exact same amount of damage. The boss fights are short and forgettable, with ones like Thumos the Unbroken being a complete joke, as you can just stunlock him with literally anything and just keep shooting to win, and Gaul, the final hyped up boss, being a piece of cake that takes barely any effort in a fire team of two. Look upon me, Dominus of the Red Legion. Annihilator of suns! Razor of a thousand worlds! Slayer of gods and conqueror of the light! I am gone! And I have become legend. The enemies are almost always the same Cabal, Legionary, Scions, or Centurions, with some Vex sprinkled in between, leaving almost no enemy diversity, which feels straight up lazy on Bungie's part. The characters are not very complex, and almost no character development occurs, with some cringy humor moments that are supposed to make up for their characters. The only one that continues to stand out above the others is Cade 6, although the other Vanguard proved to be slightly more interesting than the previous games, though are still very shallow. I really did enjoy the soundtrack, sound design, and sheer beauty of this game, and as a really incredibly made world, sad the potential was wasted on this infuriatingly out of touch developer. I mean seriously, listen to this. as if they spent their entire time building an incredible looking world and done nothing fun or interesting with it. If I'm being honest, I enjoyed the Taken King campaign more because Cade 6 had more shining moments. Eris, get your rock, 
off my map. The villain was more interesting and had a few fun boss fights, and it was actually a challenge at parts and wasn't a complete cakewalk. The final boss fight was also a bit challenging and original, and similar to the famed encounter in the raid of the DLC. In Destiny 1, the power level cap would only be achievable by completing in-game activities. This includes the Nightfall Strike, Heroic Raid, and Trials of Osiris, which was the in-game PvP content, among a few other things, and people like to call this cap the Hard Cap. There would be a second cap below that for easier and more casual activities for the less dedicated players. For the most part, this is what motivated me as a player to continue to complete the raid and nightfall among other in-game activities every week to achieve maximum power level and have gear I could readily infuse into my other gear I wanted to try out to give them higher power level. The maximum light level of Destiny 2 at the moment is 305 light, or 300 without using gear mods. This can be achieved by doing weekly milestones, including the raid, Nightfall, Clan XP Reward, Public Event Milestone, and Crucible Matches, as well as non-milestone activities, including Trials of the Nine, Iron Banner, Prestige Nightfall, Prestige Raid, Exotic Quests, Exotic Engrams, and Cade 6 Treasure Maps. That is way, way too many ways to level to the maximum level in the game. I, along with many other members of the community, think the best solution would have been to increase the maximum power level to 320, and have loot above 300 power level to drop from the Raid and Prestige Raid, Prestige Nightfall, Trials, Exotic Imgrams, and Iron Banner. Having every activity drop the highest power level gear just doesn't seem fair to the hardcore players. So that the casual players are not punished for this, non-prestige activity should never require more than the soft cap allows, so that the highest level gear is really just for minor benefits in those prestige activities. Another huge problem with the game's loot system is the loot obtained from the most difficult in-game activities, those being the raid and trials of the nine for PvE and PvP respectively. If you are in a clan with people who complete the raid and or go flawless in Trials of the Nine every week, everybody in the clan will receive a free engram containing some gear from those activities. While it is cool that the casual players will be able to use those items who might otherwise not be able to obtain them, it gives no incentive for any of those players to complete the activities at all. This participation prize loot system seriously punishes the hardcore players because it makes them feel like there isn't even a reason to be doing those activities. In Destiny 1, I completed the raid every single week to get that one weapon I needed to complete my collection, that one piece of armor I need, but now it is far too easy to obtain those items to even feel worth it. Even worse, players who complete the raid every week only are not even guaranteed one drop, and most times will only receive one to two drops in tokens, but I'll get to that later. The weapon variety in Destiny 2 is the most awful excuse for weapon variety in any shooter looter I've ever played. In the Borderlands games, there are a wide variety of weapon types, tons of unique weapons, which are essentially exotics except you can equip as many as you wish, random elemental effects, and prefixes which give the weapon a random buff. They also have different manufacturers and origins where the weapon comes from, which gives the weapon a backstory and makes them more interesting. In Destiny 1, the weapons didn't quite have this depth, but they could all be very different based on a few factors. So you see, there were three weapon types, primary, secondary, and heavy. Primary weapons would be used to eliminate adds as we call them, or the common enemies, and the ammo was very easy to obtain. The weapon types included hand cannons, pulse rifles, auto rifles, and scout rifles. Secondary weapons had far less ammo capacity and hit much harder than primary weapons. This included the weapon types sniper rifles, fusion rifles, sidearms, and shotguns. Heavy weapons did massive damage in short amounts of time, had more difficult to obtain ammo, and included the weapon types machine guns, rocket launchers, and swords. Many complained along Destiny's life cycle that special ammo was too easy to obtain in PvP, and that it was overpowered, which it was, and in response to this they decided to ruin the great system for PvE and create the primary energy and power weapon system we know now. I don't really like the new weapon system at all as now it makes most special weapons have to be used in the power slot, which renders them pretty much useless in PvE and forces you to use two primary weapons. Why would I ever use a sniper rifle over a rocket launcher in my heavy ammo slot if a rocket launcher doesn't need to reload thanks to Rally Barricade, does way more damage to bosses, and requires no effort to aim down sights and shoot? If you miss a rocket at a giant boss, you're pretty brain dead. This ultimately ruins Destiny 1's idea of becoming legend, 
when it is impossible to fuel legend because you can't even use two powerful weapons anymore. Same thing with exotic weapons. They don't feel powerful like they did in Destiny 1, where trying out all the exotics didn't really feel underwhelming. It felt exciting because of the variety of the exotics, and that they truly felt like it was worth wasting your exotic slot for it. Why in God's name would I ever use the Fighting Lion, when I can just use the Sins of the Past and melt every boss? Each legendary weapon would have a random roll that came with it, with some perks that were set, and some that were totally random. The only exception to this were weapons from the raid and trials, which had fixed roles along with a few minor exceptions. And yes, the new masterwork system that allows you to upgrade legendary weapons to get random stat rolls is a step forward, but doesn't change the perks at all, the core part of random rolls. The rolls in Destiny 1 could not be changed, and often included sights along with a few other perks such as extended mag or increased reload speed after getting precision kills. However, in the House of Wolves expansion, a new mechanic for weapon perks was introduced, weapon reforging. If you obtained a weapon from this expansion that was reforged ready, you could take it to the gunsmith in the tower to reforge it, and change the random perks it could have for the cost of a few easy to obtain materials. This was never brought back after this expansion. The biggest complaint about the random weapon rolls of Destiny 1 was PvP balance, because some weapon rolls excelled much more than others in PvP, like the god roll Isaluna. Though PvP was certainly not the main focus of the game, and I see no reason why this should matter in a PvP game mode filled with ability spam and complete chaos, because it made it fun. Destiny was never meant to have a true competitive PvP game mode. Stop trying to make this an eSport, Bungie. In response to these complaints, they decided to instead completely remove weapon variety and get rid of weapon rolls. Now once you have one of the best weapons in the game, it gives no real incentive to go try other ones out. Due to how many different combinations of weapons there were in Destiny 1, many were top tier and left lots of variety throughout the community's favorite weapons to use. It overall has completely eliminated an almost endless grind for the player to keep trying to get that one weapon roll they have been chasing after for a very long time. This really compromises the quality of my experience of Destiny 2, as I find myself using only a few different weapons. I think that they should bring back random rolls along with a reforge option like in the House of Wolves so that it wouldn't be too difficult to obtain that one weapon you had always been looking for. Weapon mods have been added to try to make gear and weapons more interesting, and I believe they ultimately have failed to do so. The only thing weapon mods do that is meaningful is increase the power level of your gear if they are legendary. The furthest weapon mods go in terms of customization is to change the element of your power and energy weapons, with kinetic mods doing literally nothing other than increasing the power. Armor mods are far more complex, but still pretty shallow. Mods may give bonuses to handling for specific weapon types, reload speed, reduced recoil, decreased ability cooldowns for specific elements, and extra stat bonuses to resilience, mobility, or recovery. While these are all fine, I feel like there should be more specific mods given by in-game PvE activities, such as the raid, that will give bonuses that will help you for things in the raid, such as bonus damage against Cabal, or grenade energy recovered when you get a precision kill on a Cabal. Whenever you complete an activity in Destiny 2, including strikes, public events for each planet, crucible matches, and the raid, you are awarded tokens. These tokens may be used to turn into a vendor for a random chance at an item from a specific pool. Although in the newest update, I believe you can purchase armor and weapons from vendors each week with legendary shards and tokens. I really do not like the new token system. It makes drops feel unrewarding because you are forced to go to an external source to reap your rewards. I would be fine if they were like legendary marks in Destiny 1 and were used every now and then for a cool weapon roll that week rather than being one of the core loot systems in Destiny 2. The new shader system in Destiny 2 has been criticized by the community since launch pretty heavily. To activate a shader on gear, you have to use glimmer for some reason, and shaders are no longer permanently unlocked, but rather given in small quantities from different activities and microtransactions, with the only really cool looking ones coming from from, well, loot boxes and microtransactions. I really like the idea of using shaders on each piece of armor rather than your entire set like in Destiny 1, but why not just make the shaders permanently unlocked when you get them? In Destiny 1, all shaders were permanently unlocked. The only reason I can see giving shaders in these small quantities is so that if you want more, you will pay for them. The character customization system is also a bit too shallow in my opinion. They need to add more options for the character customization, and while it doesn't need to be as complicated as something like Black Desert Online, it would be nice to be able to customize your body and your face. 
The ghost that accompanies us everywhere we go should also be more customizable. I think that you should be able to change how the ghost looks, but also be able to change what bonuses it gives, as I hate being forced to use one ghost I don't like the look of because it gives me more XP in a certain planet. Also, please bring back Ghost Ghost, that was the best ghost ever. In Destiny 1, once you had gotten all the armor and weapons you desire from the raid, there were still much more rare drops you could obtain. Even if you ran the raid every week, or after the Age of Triumph update, all four raids every week, it would still be a rare occurrence to obtain these items. I remember running the raid every week just to try to get that infamous Nano Phoenix ship, and when I got it, almost nobody in my group had it and were extremely jealous. While these items such as shaders, sparrows, and ships don't give you in-game bonuses, they were still rewards that could show how dedicated a hardcore player really is and gave them something to chase after. Now you just open up a poorly made loot box with some lifeless, boring ships and shaders that have no relevance to your guardian, or the journey you have taken as one. The subclass customization in Destiny 2 has gone even further back than Destiny 1. While the subclass customization in Destiny 1 wasn't much, it still allowed you to optimize your build to whatever exotic you were running or playstyle you had adapted to. It allowed you to mix and match different perks and try new builds that may be fun to mess around with. I love some of these new perks they introduced in Destiny 1, but it sucks having only two options to use these perks and having them bound together in only two separate paths. I touched on the subject of incentive earlier in the video, but I'd like to go more in depth with it. There aren't many activities in Destiny 2. There are adventures, there are strikes, there are crucible matches, there are public events, there are weekly raids, Iron Banner every month, Trials of the Nine, but the game doesn't really give you a reason to do most of these. Once you're max power, what's even the point of playing? You may enjoy playing raids or doing the weekly nightfall, but it's only fun for so long. No activities really feel rewarding anymore. I don't want to go to some public events to get a random exotic or fill up my XP bar to get some lame emblems and shaders from greedy loot boxes. The only reason I did public events in Crucible each week was for weekly milestones to get powerful gear and get XP, and that only lasted until less than a month after the game came out. Perhaps some exclusive armor or treasure maps or something that makes the adventures exciting. In the Curse of Osiris stream, the adventure they claimed to be rewarding only rewarded a token and a blue. And yes, I know that they have addressed some of these issues a bit with their most recent blog post, though I don't believe it is enough, as many core mechanics of the game are hurting it way too much. I know it takes a while to develop these things, but please don't make us pay money to have our game fixed with these DLCs. I mean seriously, we give them feedback for months, and they respond with one tiny blog post that does almost nothing to improve the state of the game? It's insulting! The game came out on PC one month ago, and they are already making us pay $20 to play content that should be in a free update to the tiny game we got at launch. I love to see that Bungie claims Destiny 2 is a game where friendships are made, when the social aspect of the game is so minimal, it's baffling. Let's face it, Bungie, you may not have intended to craft an MMO, but you have, and if it shall continue to be supported like one, changes must be made to the social aspect. When you go to social areas, it's impossible to speak to people unless you whisper to them or add them to your friends list and invite them to your fire team. And it's only possible to whisper to people if they have whispering from random strangers toggled on, which is not set by default. It is so frustrating to be doing a public event and not even be able to activate the heroic mode because my teammate doesn't know how to. If I was able to, I would happily tell them how so I could get my heroic loot and move on. And other MMOs in the market, you're totally allowed to speak to anyone you wish in an open chat, whisper, clan chat, etc. MMOs are focused on speaking to random people, making friends, and playing with them in activities and game often. There is even full text and voice chat functionality in games like CSGO or Overwatch, and those aren't even MMOs. When I used to play Wizard 101 every day, I'd always have somebody to talk to because I would befriend them as I explored the vast worlds the game had to offer. They were my friends because I had completed tens of dungeons with them and chatted with them all the time. In Destiny 2, I've made zero friends after almost 100 hours of playtime. The closest I've come to making friends was joining a raid group via an external website rather than using something that takes minimal effort to add in. A raid chat where you can recruit people to your group super easily or just having friends I could invite anyways. Yes, I'm in a clan, but the only reason I'm in it is to get my weekly engrams and move on with my day. I propose that at least a few new chat channels should be added, including a global chat, social space chat for the instance you are in, an LFG chat to recruit guardians to join their fire team, and a clan chat to chat with your clan members easily. Now, I'm going to discuss the root of almost every loot and progression issue with this game. Player vs. Player The Crucible is Destiny 2's PvP mode and involves 4v4 combat only, a peer-to-peer -peer connection, which causes massive latency and therefore kill training occurs often, where two players kill each other at the same time. 
There are a few game modes for Destiny 2's PvP, however there are only three playlists. Competitive, Quick Play, and Trials of the Nine from Friday through Monday. In Destiny 1, you had three classic game modes including classic retired maps that aren't in the normal playlists, private matches, which were some of the most fun I've ever had in year 3 when they added them, six other playlists in the middle which included Rift, Supremacy, Rumble, Clash, Skirmish, maybe some more, and then some weekly playlists that included some crazy modifiers like faster ability recharge, no radar or supers, or even doubles, and of course Trials of Osiris or Elimination if that wasn't active. This offered many options for what you can play, instead of throwing you into some 4v4 game mode you didn't choose and forcing you to try to cheaply team shoot every player when you're against a 4-man team of clan members. Destiny 1 and 6v6 which offered lots of chaos, ability for one-on-one -on -one fights, and faster ability recharge which allowed Destiny 1 to have less competitive, fun crucible that the game was meant to have. Destiny is all about using chaos and space magic to defeat your enemy, and it was so much f more fun to run around the map with a shotgun, or hide in the shadows with a sniper, or voop with the fusion rifle. Now it just feels like your generic, effortless shooter. I'm totally fine with having ranked competitive 4 4 playlists, but please don't bring that into our casual, fun game modes with weapon diversity and spread out the playlists like you did in Destiny 1 so we can choose what to play. It's no fun playing Supremacy 5 times in a row when you just wanted to play Control. And the worst part about all this is that it has brought a negative effect into our PvE system. Bungie, so many MMOs have tried to keep PvE and PvP balancing linked, but it has never worked if you're trying to make a balanced PvP. Why do you think that they removed random rolls from the game? Why do you think that they changed the weapon system to kinetic energy and power? Why do you think the subclasses have such little customization now? By trying to balance PvP, they have even ruined PvP itself, because it is so uninteresting and offers no diversity between the players, and they are all just using the same weapon with the same role. Iron Banner is garbage. I'm, I hate to say that, but it is. It is just glorified quick play limited to one game mode, which is fine, but the issue is that it has nothing to offer other than that. It is just more the same with better rewards. Perhaps bring back light level enabled, but only up to 305? Uh, really anything could make this game more interesting. I feel that dedicated servers would be a very valuable addition and a core feature in any online PC multiplayer game. This peer-to-peer -peer connection is very outdated and results in a worse gameplay experience. They also removed a ton of the awesome game modes from Destiny 1, like Rift, and especially Rumble. Rumble was the only free-for-all game mode in Destiny 1, and a lot of people enjoyed it, so I see no reason to remove it. Destiny 2's raid takes place on a Leviathan ship, a planet destroyer ruled by former Red Legion ruler Kallus, who was arrested by Gaul and some of Kallus' advisors and was exiled to the Leviathan. The Leviathan is a planet destroyer that creates royal wine by consuming planets, literally. The royal wine is consumed by Gaul, meaning he literally drinks planets, which is pretty intimidating if you ask me. The coolest part is, the reason you're completing this raid is because Kallus invited you. He just wants to test your worth so that you can prove your might to him with a series of trials and lacks any boss fight until the raid boss, Kallus. And unlike the Destiny 1 raids, which featured multiple bosses throughout and some smaller scale encounters in between. I think it's awesome that he's not hes not some powerful ancient villain or something like that, he's just testing your might. He wants to watch you go through his trials for his entertainment. And that's really what makes this raid so special compared to the other Destiny raids. The only initial disappointment I have with this raid is that we only got to explore the tiny chin of the ship instead of the huge planet destroyer I thought we were. Now that it has been revealed that there will be two additional raid layers per DLC to explore the rest of the ship, I'm alright with that, except for the fact that you have to pay for DLC. Anyways, the raid opens up with you in front of the ship, and you climb a massive staircase and have the option of either going under the ship to get to your locations, which would be for the more experienced players who have run the raid before, or to enter through the massive door into the Castellum. Now, the Castellum is an encounter that you will repeat if you choose not to get to your encounter via the underbelly. Uh, this part's fine in my opinion, it just annoys me that you're required to do it in every single encounter. It's easy and only requires you to obtain banners by killing larger enemies and bringing them to a pad in front of a door. You are then supposed to kill mini bosses to obtain more banners, while some members stay back to guard the flag from liberators who will take your flag if you let them. It's not bad at all, just repetitive as I mentioned. The next three encounters leading up to the boss are in a rotation each week. 
Pleasure Gardens, the Gauntlet, and the Royal Baths. One week, the first door you open may be one encounter depending on the rotation, and the next two will follow that rotation. Starting off with the Pleasure Gardens, this one requires you to have four people on the ground being called to where these spores are by two shooters, and you have to go up to them and somebody from above standing in a pillar of light will shoot them to give damage buffs for the damage phase. Each person is assigned a spore to go to before the encounter is started in an organized group. If you alert any dogs on the ground while activating spores, or you run out of time, a 30 second damage phase will activate and you will unload your rockets and supers into the dogs. Most fails in this part of the raid are just dumb perfectionist mistakes or that one guy activates the dog and it tears random groups apart, making it really difficult to pass for solo players with no friends or clan to play with. Next, I'll talk about the gauntlet. The gauntlet requires almost no shooting except for a few enemies here and there that are laughably easy to kill. There are four pillars around that people will stand on to start the encounter, and two runners. Once all enemies have been killed, the runner will grab the orb to enter a gauntlet area and call out what triangles need to be shot for him to progress through the gauntlet. This repeats three times until all players can go to the middle and grab an orb to enter the gauntlet themselves. Then everybody will run through it, avoiding all the obstacles, and it can get really chaotic, especially with random teams. And similar to the previous encounter, most fails in this section are just dumb little mistakes that can destroy and break apart random teams easily, which puts yet another hurdle into the solo player's way. Okay. okay. Oh, dude. It's three of you. Where have I won? I don't even know how I died. I think your explosion killed me or something. Guys, guys, revive. I got a revive. Oh, I got a revive. Not like this. Oh, nice. Hey, that took. That was a bop and a half. Yo. The final encounter is the Royal Baths, which requires four players to constantly stand on plates and rotate with people in the middle to get a buff which gives temporary immunity to the ground that kills you in the plates area. Standing on the plates brings a chain down, and once all chains are down in all four corners, players will meet in the middle for a damage phase to knock down sensors, I believe they are called, while one or two people will take care of the ads that attack you. This encounter is similar to the Totems and King's Fall from Destiny 1 in that it requires people to communicate rotations with each other to maintain a plate to trigger an event. It isn't as communication heavy as the previous encounters, but you still can easily mess up with weak communication, which is another random team destroyer. A consistency between all these encounters is that they require stronger communication, which is annoying for random raid groups and involves little of what can make a raid encounter very interesting if done right. Shooting, the core gameplay of Destiny. The final encounter is my personal favorite, Kallus, and while he is probably one of my least favorite final raid bosses in the Destiny franchise, only second to Crota from Crota's End, the encounter is a unique one that isn't very difficult for randoms to pass as it relies more on shooting than communication. The team is split into two groups, people who will stay in the void or stay with Kallus. The away team has to call out symbols for people with Kallus so that they know which sign to melee to progress. Eventually, the people in the away team are able to shoot skulls to increase the boss damage multiplier for the damage phase. Alright, here, I'll put the first shield. Alright, 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 the home and away team can stand on four different plates at a time to damage the boss, and once his health bar is all the way down, you get to shoot him a bit more, and then you win. Okay, don't have mine yet. I'll put mine up okay. next. Next plate. Oh, I got a Yeah, I fell off. Off, 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 off. Alright, move dog. Stand for that too far back. Oh, I, slid. I actually slid. No, you can put it backwards so everyone gets in. I went the wrong way. Yeah. Fuck! I didn't activate it, but I went the wrong way. I didn't. Yeah. Alright, this thing shooting at me. Get right, off, get right, off. Right, right, right. Holy shit, I have one HP. I got res, I got res. Alright, yep. Yeah. You got a res in that. We can give him to half, that's fine. Alright, shoot him in his chest now. It's a critical spot to his chest. That's a phase. Hopefully, we can give him to half at least. So now he's gonna point the gun instead of his hand, so just whenever he does that, hit right yeah. there. Oh. Okay, stop shooting, stop wasting him out. Get right, off. Go, go, go. Everyone here, go, 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 go. Get on, get on, get on. 
DPS. 91 stacks. Good job. I'm, I'm, I'm on, I'm on. Valley? Oh. Okay. To, do next time. Alright, I'll do next time. After. We phase him. Watch out, watch out. Oh, get off, get off, get off, get off. Yeah, yeah I know. Dodge. Watch out for the shield after you, you think he's killed. Yeah, I'm out. Off. Go, go, go. go. Axes. Can you rally barricade the next one or no? Uh, yeah, next one I can. Alright. Let's use primary. Alright, save like rockets for the final. Oh, Alright, he's gonna cast another overshield once he dies. So we're gonna have to kill him. Alright, just shoot right. him. Shoot him. Shoot him. Should be good. Yeah, we'll fall. GG, good yes. job, boys. GG, guys. I really enjoyed this encounter consistently across every run I completed it, as it wasn't too communication heavy but still had a sense of coordination, and it actually let me shoot things for once. Overall, I think that this raid was a terrible decision to be the first raid released in Destiny 2. Now if this was the fifth raid of Destiny 1, I would love it because the raids in Destiny 1 aren't like this one at all. Though raids so communication heavy and a communication deprived game will seem super intimidating to newer players and will not bring many people into experiencing raids in Destiny before the raid and fitted the raid's theme and honestly looks amazing and the different guns and armor for the normal and heroic or prestige as it's called now. Uh, versions of the raid. Now you aren't even guaranteed items from the raid, as I've heard some players have gotten nothing at all from it, but this hasn't happened to me so I can't confirm. And the game decides to supplement you with tokens instead of actual raid drops from the bosses themselves, so that you can turn it into the raid vendor at the tower, and it doesn't feel rewarding at all to turn in your rewards to an external source that's not even in the raid to get the rewards. I probably wouldn't feel that rewarded if I got my Vex Mythoclast in Destiny 1, which, if you don't know, was an extremely sought after and powerful weapon in the vanilla state of the game. Vex! I'm at the vex! Oh my gosh! Ah! Uh, but if I got that from some tower vendor rather than two hours of struggling with a random group on the final raid boss, to have that moment of triumph and get the weapon of my dreams, that would be pretty stupid and honestly just defeats the purpose of raiding. You raid to get the awesome loot and get excited about it once you defeat the boss. Overall, I think this raid was just disappointing and had a lot of missed potential and could have been so much more than what it ended up being. Bungie has been very shady and odd about their decision making since the release of Destiny 2. When it was released on PC, players who had played Destiny 1 and linked their Bungie account were not given better rewards, and the console players were, which was really frustrating to me. I played quite a lot of that game and would like to have at least have something to show for it. The game doesn't allow you to record or have other programs interfere with Destiny 2, like OBS and Discord Overlay, which is very annoying to many people, including me. If they can blacklist those programs, why not just whitelist them? OBS is surely safe as it hasn't ruined any other games. It's certainly not a cheat engine or program used to exploit anything in the game. Though the first event that has occurred that really made me suspicious about Bungie's intention with this game was the discovery that Bungie was accelerating our XP gain to prevent us from getting bright engrams for free, Destiny's version of cosmetic loot boxes. What makes this all the more shady is that they sold Pop-Tart packages that would give extra XP and Fireteam medallions to boost XP gains only for players to learn that doing too many easier activities such as public events would make you lose tons and tons of XP while showing up with the normal amount on the display. Suddenly, when they got bad press from many different websites, they posted that the system is not performing the way they'd like it to. Please just shut up. If the system wasn't performing the way you'd like it to, it wouldn't be like that in the first place. And then they proceeded to fix it, and also doubled the XP cap for obtaining a bright engram behind our backs, once again called out by the community. Why are these loot boxes even in the game in the first place? It deeply saddens me that to get the cool ships and sparrows I used to equip with pride so that people know I had grinded for them, that I played the raid a lot to get them, are locked behind these insulting loot boxes. The recent DLC that came out for $20 actually blocked out content that non-DLC owners own from the vanilla version of the game because they increased the light level for those activities to be too high above non-DLC owners. This was a huge issue in Destiny 1 that never really got any attention, but after all this behind the scenes sneaking behind our back making huge headlines in gaming journalism, it finally got the attention it needed. All this and more breaks my heart, as Bungie has just been awful to their previously loving and supportive community just to make some extra cash. But they know players will, regardless of their terrible practices, buy the DLCs and give them money to support the cash cow Destiny has become.
The reason people will continue to buy the DLCs and the reason some people will keep playing the game is because people want this game to be good. Why wouldn't you want a sci-fi MMORPG FPS game? This sounds like the perfect combo for me, and Bungie has realized that if they keep promising these fixes in the DLCs and slowly are making the game better, it will rake in so much cash. They can keep making bad decision after bad decision, but ultimately it doesn't matter to them, only the money does. I would have liked to recommend this game, but I honestly can't. The game is just too shallow in anything it tries to be. The social aspect is abysmal, especially for a PC game. The loot is lame and leaves no in-game grind. It's not deep enough to be a true MMO. The gameplay is very repetitive, and most of all, it doesn't have much to offer. It's a small game. Overall, the only audience I could recommend this game to is for the casual player looking for a fun FPS with a decent campaign, but only on sale. Actually, scratch that. Don't buy this game, and do not support these insulting practices. Go play Warframe. The developers actually listen to the fans, the game is free, fun, and has a lot to offer. It's easy to sink hundreds of hours into, and you can actually make friends. Or go play The Division, or just go play something that's actually cared about and will continue to improve with player feedback. Destiny 2 has an awful endgame, and if you're looking for a long time MMO to raid every single week and continue to progress no matter how many hours you sink into it, you'll be very disappointed. I did enjoy the game while it lasted, though. Its fault started to shine through very quickly and led to my collective disappointment and what a great opportunity Bungie missed. One of Bungie's biggest mistake here was making a new game because they abandoned something that they had worked to build up for three years, a product that so many people had fallen in love with. Destiny 1 was a better game because, let's be honest, the improvements Destiny 2 made weren't for the reasons that you played the first game. The best way I can describe this game is a perfect example of, don't fix what isn't broken. A development roadmap was released on April 11th, and all you can see on it is Bungie trying to do their best to revert this game to Destiny 1, and all of the major changes are coming during the month of the large expansion, so people will buy the DLC, of course. It's far too safe and marketed towards the average consumer that will buy it, play the campaign, maybe try some strikes in public events, and then leave until the next DLC comes out. This game just makes zero sense to me. It is completely possible to create a game that casual players can enjoy as well as hardcore players. The players that will continue to play the game, the ones who will buy your DLCs and purchase some microtransactions are the players that you need to worry about. The only people who are still playing or care about Destiny 2 are the true hardcore players. I totally believe that there are some hardworking people at Bungie trying to make this game great. Here's a tweet by a dev named Josh Hamrick replying to a presumably troll comment responding to his excitement for Destiny 2's future. This is not a corporate PR stunt. Destiny 2's PR team is a complete joke who doesn't understand people, and this is a statement coming from the heart, from a guy who is trying his absolute best to win back the love of the fans. Destiny 2 is just very expected. Most features some would praise it for are essential for any MMO game of the skill to have, like an open world or a narrative. These are expected in any AAA game, which leaves Destiny 2 in an awkward spot where it doesn't really stand out at all. This is the first time I wasn't excited for a DLC for Destiny, and I didn't even buy it. I mean, I spent $60 on the game, are you really going to charge me $20 for a terribly short campaign, some new strikes, and a raid lair? No thanks, I haven't even played the game since November. Soon after the game's release, I would have hoped that one day I would love Destiny 2 as I once loved Destiny 1, and that one day they would realize their mistakes and learn from them for the future experiences this game holds. I think I'm done. I don't want to buy any of this stupid, overpriced DLC. I'm not waiting a year for them to implement basic features that should have been in the game from the start. I can't tell you to follow me, but I can advise you to, because it's not worth what little time you would spend on the game, and it certainly isn't worth your money. I have gone from thinking about Destiny all day at school to putting the game down for good. Bungie is a terrible developer, and I can't trust them anymore because they have lied to me over and over again, and it is just plain insulting at this point. Just look at the dawning event. Complete, microtransaction filled, Heartless, corporate, garbage. We're looking at a total cost that roughly ranges between $1,860 and $63,409.08 to obtain every item in Destiny 2. And when they mess up, they send some stupid apology that they'll do better in the future, only to mess up again. Goodbye, Destiny, and goodbye, Bungie. It was a wild ride, and you've given me some of the greatest gaming experiences of my life. Maybe one day, I'll come back. Maybe one day, I can log on to Destiny on Tuesday afternoon, hop into the weekly prestige raid, complete the nightfall, claim my weekly bounties, farm keys for heroic strikes, and look forward to the next day when the gunsmith has a new set of weapon rolls for me to look at. Maybe one day, I can spend four hours on a boss encounter with randoms until we finally complete it and I get the scout rifle I've been trying to get for a month. Maybe one day, Destiny will actually be fun again.